Hopefully that's on now. I'll keep talking for a second here for you. Yeah. Okay, let's get started. So uh, last time we talked, we started our work on perception, right? And uh, <clears throat> I had intended to get through iterative closest point. We didn't quite get through it, so I'll finish that off today. And, uh, and the goal for today, last time we sort of assumed perfect point clouds. We assumed that our sensors were, uh, you know, giving us the best possible information that, that they could given the you know, projection through the lens, but there's no, there was no noise, there was no outliers, there were no, nothing like this. So today we're gonna think about what happens when those point clouds get messy, because real point clouds are very messy. And think about ways, we're gonna sort of modify our basic computational framework to, to make this more robust. And uh, I think, uh, you know, these, there's a couple particular algorithms I'll try to show you. And I think they kind of represent a nice way to understand the problem, understand what you can do with it. There are many different variants out there, but I think there's a few that you can you know, get a taste for what, what's possible. So just to set that up again, remember that our goal for today, for this week, I guess, is to do the same thing we did before, but we've added these D415 cameras, and now we are um, reasoning about where in the scene I, uh, hid my point cloud there, but we're actually using those cameras to find the mustard bottle. First by taking pictures, then by turning those pictures, those, those depth return, RGBD um, images into a point cloud. This is actually the result of after filtering the point cloud, uh, getting it down to just the, the mustard that's left there and removing the bins and all the, 
the distractors and stuff like this. And then what we'll see is we run ICP on this algorithm, on this uh, mustard bottle in order to, to then accomplish the task. Okay. So we started last time by, uh, with a really important component of the algorithm that started us thinking about sort of connections between the kinematics problems we've talked about and the perception problems we're starting to talk about. So we started off by saying we were given a few things. We were given a model in the form of a point cloud, so our model points, where we wrote them as a bunch of points, uh, <clears throat> model i. And we were given, we had this canonical model frame in the object frame, right? I'll write bigger, I remembered. Okay, <clears throat> and then we also had scene points. This is what we got from our basic, you know, from the camera with a little bit of processing to put it into a point cloud format. And this was originally we obtained some scene points in the camera coordinates, and then we assumed we had the camera pose. So this is the camera, right? And then the biggest assumption we made last time was that point MI corresponded with, point, with scene point SI, right? So we somehow could look at the picture, look at through our camera and know that there was a particular point in the point cloud and that should be associated with a particular point in our model, okay? If we have this setup, that it's incredibly useful to know that given that setup, we can write an objective like this, minimize over the unknown pose, which would be the pose of the object in the world. And when I'm writing it as an optimization, I wanna be clear, our notation sort of makes it clear, but I wanna be super clear that as a, as a argument to a mathematical program that this is uh, an object that is the um, poses. So uh, the special Euclidean group three, okay? And the objective is that for all of the eyes, I'd like that if I take both the model points and the scene points into the world frame, then their distance is small. And I tried to show you the landscape of this. This is a quadratic objective, right? When I, plot, I, when I plotted it with just two decision variables, which I you know, could do in 2D with just rotations, right? Then it looks like a, just this quadratic bowl. And then this constraint here, the fact that, this, that these are not arbitrary rotation matrices inside here, meant that there was an extra constraint, which was that unit disk. And we'll, we'll see that picture again. But this was a, sort of a nice optimization problem, and it has a great, uh, a, you know, a closed form. It's a numerical, but an algorithm that's almost as good as closed form solution via SVD, singular value decomposition. That's where we were last time, right? I wanna just point out again, uh, point out quickly here because we're gonna, we're gonna play with different formulations of this today and, and different ways that are gonna, you know, be good optimizations, ugly optimizations that are gonna give certain robustness properties. Um, <clears throat> maybe we, there's a, a point to plane version of this where you can try to correspond points to whole faces of a mesh, for instance. There's a bunch of versions of this, but we're gonna be doing manipulations on these basic equations, okay? Uh, so the first one, just to observe right off the bat, is that if I had written instead, if I wanted to transform the scene points into the object frame, for instance. If I had done, um, what do I want? I want the transform from the world, let's say, into object frame, which would be the inverse of this transform. And I'd written this optimization, 
with this guy. That has a, that's solving for a different transform. This is trying to put the points together, everything in the object frame, okay? But from the, from the point of view of an optimization problem, this looks identical and can also be solved with SVD, right? This is still, you know, linear in this, in the decision variables here, plus some constraints that are solved by SVD. Okay, so you can go back and forth and we're gonna move these things around and we'll understand where it breaks and where it, where it works. Okay, but I want to address this, um, this big assumption because really how could you possibly know what, which point in the, mod, you know, if I get a, a point cloud of, of a mustard bottle, you know, how am I possibly gonna know which one goes with the top, you know, which one goes with the bottom? There's, that's maybe the, the hardest part of perception is to make that, that leap. Okay, so I think a picture, uh, well actually the picture on the screen uh, is a pretty, pretty useful one. So, this is, a, remember, my blue is my model. My salmon colored is my scene, right? The brown is what I get when they over, overlap, and it wasn't artistically chosen, clearly, okay? And the green here, the green lines are the correspondences. I just drew in saying, if I said that this point corresponds to this point, I'll just draw a line. Okay, so let's say I didn't have those correspondences, but I had this initial frame uh, of, the, of the model points and these initial scene points. You can imagine, and the algorithm's name is a pretty good indication of what the first thing we're gonna try is, a fairly good heuristic would be to say, let's just guess that the points that are, the correspondences are the points that are closest in space. I'll have an initial guess of the object, and I'll have the, initial, the, the actual scene points, and let's just start by saying the ones that are closest in Euclidean distance are the ones that correspond. Okay, it's interesting, right here you'd see that this one on the first guess might get it wrong, that this point would correspond to this point probably. But if enough of the points correspond to the right points, well, I'll make this precise in a second here, then we can have an algorithm that can be, I think, actually very effective. So this is the iterative closest point algorithm, which is doing exactly this, and I'll, I'll write the equations down to make that precise in just a second. And what you can see is even if the first guess is wrong, and then you solve for a new pose, given this singular, singular value decomposition, it puts you in a new condition where you can try to make your correspondences again, and as long as that alternation converges, you can get global solutions to this. Now we're gonna, it's, this, is not, this is also susceptible to local minima, you'll see the bad cases in a minute too, but this is the basic algorithm I wanna understand next, okay? So the iterative closest point algorithm. Is gonna to try to solve for the correspondences. So we need a notation for our correspondences. We're gonna have an initial guess. Ooh. For the object. I'll stick with the original one. We're moving the object or the, the model into the scene points, okay? When I'm gonna do an estimate, I'm gonna to try to use this hat notation to say this is my guess at the true x, uh, okay? So given this, I wanna find correspondences. So step one, And I'm gonna write the correspondences in a correspondence vector, okay? So let's just write it like this. I'll, I'll call it this, the, the vector C here, where I'll say C, um, let me do CI, the ith element of this vector C. I'll choose as my heuristic to take the, the point that is the minimum distance, okay? I'll make sure this notation's clear in just a second. Given my initial estimate x hat, argument over j, I'll search over all of the j's, psi x squared. 
And since this is just going to be a guess at the correspondences, I'll put a hat there too. OK, so what is this? This is saying that I'll take each point. For, for every scene point i, I want to find a corresponding um, model point j. Okay, So I'm going to loop through all of the possible j's, try all the possible model points, and compute the distance between that model point j and my scene point i that I'm considering. And whichever one minimizes it, so min would be the value of the optimization, and argmin is the is the element j which causes this to be smallest. That's the difference between min versus argmin, yeah? So this is returning the element j, and I'll tuck that into the vector c. Is that notation clear? So this is a vector of integers, yeah? So how would you compute this, right, in general? So we talked about quadratic optimization over there. This is now an integer optimization, but it's just a list of numbers, so you can just compute all, in worst case, you can compute all of the distances and just take the smallest one. There's a finite number of things to compute, just take the smallest one. In practice, we don't do that. In practice, there's efficient data structure for nearest neighbor queries, so we're gonna use those. So KD trees, there's, good, there's public libraries for, that make these very fast. Okay, approximate nearest neighbor queries and the like, okay? So in practice, you can make this computation, uh, use your, your best nearest neighbor data structures. Okay. And then step two, the, way I'm, the reason I chose this notation is then I can just say uh, my new x hat is the, um, The result of that optimization with just the um, the correspondence is written in here. So I've got model point C I hat in here minus P S I. Okay. See what I did? I gotta sum all these up over I. So for <clears throat> I used to just have MI here, assume that I knew one-to-one -one correspondence. Now I'm going to say I'm going to take whichever model point corresponds to that scene point. And I'll sum over all the scene points, and I can still, it's from the optimization perspective, same, the same as that optimization. So I can use my SVD. Is the algorithm clear? It's the simplest, it's like the, um, the bread and butter Point cloud algorithm. Okay, you'll see it used all in lots of places. Yes. Good. Yeah. So, so <clears throat> um, the question was, what if the dimensions don't match? So I made a choice here with my notation to say that I'd like to say for every scene point, I'll try to find a model that corresponds. Okay. We're going to talk about that. So that has implications. So um, you know. In the case of partial views, for instance, that makes a lot of sense. Well, I'll say this very carefully in a minute. But I made a choice so far to say that all I'm requiring is that every scene point, it corresponds with one uh, model point. Okay? Uh, you, could have the, it, it, you could have many model points for ones that are used by the same. Or you could have, sorry, one model point that's used by many scene points. You could have some model points that are used by no scene points. Okay? But this notation says that for all the scene points, I'll do this. Good question? Yes? Does this algorithm work if you don't go around all the possible correspondences you take the that's, that's a great question. So the question is, what happens if you don't take all of the correspondences, but you take a few of them? And I think we're going to have to do that at some point to address uh, some messiness. So we're going we're to think about the right way to do that. Yeah. So at some point, we're going to have, um, have to deal with that. And let me give you an example right away that sort of I think makes that point. Imagine if I had um, my object of interest here, okay, and this is the ghost of the, I'll use my reddish color for my scene points, okay. You get the idea? Okay, 
And what happens if, I don't know, there was a reflection or something, okay? And I got a couple scene points way over here, right? And I have my model that started off with some initial guess, okay? So this is nicely getting pulled in this direction, okay? But I said so far that every scene point corresponds to at least one model point. So these points are still gonna pick some point on that blue on the model, and they're gonna pull this in this direction, right? They're trying to minimize the distance between the corresponding points. My, see, I've got all the colors here. I can say, you know, if I've got some green correspondences here, I guess that would be the shortest one would be a straight line. That's orthogonal like this, and then, right? Even if I have a lot of good correspondences here, you know, that's pulling me this way, I can have even a very small number of correspondences that are far off, but because that distance is large, they can have an uh, overwhelming effect on the quality of the algorithm, okay? Now, so that's a reason maybe that the, it feels unnatural to say that every scene point has to match with at least one model point. That makes you susceptible to outliers. But the reason I chose that was because there's another direction too, right? Which is that what if I only have um, partial views, okay? Right, so I've got a camera, um, I'll use white for my camera here. I've got my camera over here and it's looking down and I can see this part of the object, but I'm not seeing any points over here. Okay, so if I said for instance, that every model point has to correspond with one scene point, that would be the opposite choice, if I had made the opposite choice over there. Then again, I've got some model points here which don't have a correspondence here, and they will cause big, you know, big artifacts potentially here. So you can choose either to correspond scene to model, or model to scene, one of them, the scene to model, I think, makes you susceptible to outliers. And the model to scene makes you susceptible to partial views. Okay? And that's kind of the point of the lecture, is that we're gonna to have to do a little bit better than both of those. I would say that um, these are the dominant problems, the ways that, you know, the, the important ways that real point clouds are messy, right? I would say Messy is a silly term, but noise is taken. I, I would say I want to reserve noise for something um, like, uh, I'll say, say in a minute. So what would noise be in the context of a perception system like this? Maybe I, I measure the, the true scene point, but plus or minus some Gaussian noise, for instance. Right, so every, every one of those points is just perturbed with some Gaussian. That's what... It, this is, I shouldn't say this, but I was gonna say that's what all the theorists pick, right? When they try to prove something about perception or something like this, they always assume Gaussian noise, right? But that's not what real cameras do. It's, in fact, I would say that the, um, you know, it's the easiest thing to analyze, but it's, the, um, it's not a property. I'd say the, the real cameras are actually very low in terms of noise. Um, and this kind of noise is relatively easy to be robust to. In fact, <clears throat> we've already got relatively good robustness to noise just by writing it in the, this least squares objective, right? To some extent, if you've got Gaussian noise added in here, then you'd expect this least squares objective to be the right metric for rejecting that noise. So by, by virtue of, you know, not, not asking, David, you asked the last time about it, whether we should make this equality and what that looks like, by asking for it to be softer, this gives us nice robustness to that Gaussian noise. 
but I think um, partial views are a very big one. You just, you're never going to see the bottom of your object that's sitting on the table <laughs> until you pick it up, right? Like no amount of looking around or whatever is going to get you see the bottom. Right? So you're going to have partial views. Another way to um, that you get partial views is from occlusions. Partly is just by having a camera looking from one angle, but also when objects, when you get more cluttered scenes, you'll have occlusions. You know, something will block your view of an object. And I think the last big one is, um, you know, it's a type of noise maybe, but the outliers are, let's, de let's define them as spurious random points added to the image in, very, in arbitrary locations. A, a reasonable model, I think, of this would be, um, would be just choose uniformly over the, over the viewing window points at random. If you can be robust to that kind of outliers, that's a, that's a first order sort of robustness. More interesting outliers are where you have other objects. For instance, maybe you have a mustard bottle but you have a ketchup bottle nearby and it's kind of got some of the same shapes, but clearly your perception system should be able to disambiguate them, but maybe these kind of algorithms might get pulled towards the ketchup bottle and never break free if they're similar enough, right? So those outliers can be um, pretty complicated. I'd say there's at least one more type that you have to worry about with real cameras, which are dropouts. You remember the picture I showed of some of the real cameras? Uh, yeah, like this. This has got, um, you know, this is what real things look like. You'll just have no returns from the side or sh shiny parts of the images. Okay, so we want to be robust to that. Okay, but given this basic algorithm, I guess I got ahead of myself a little bit. Um, you know, this is a very powerful basic algorithm, right? This, this is just the ICP, and this is the Stanford Bunny, which you basically, if you were ever to write an ICP paper, you must, it seems you must use, like for a, a condition for acceptance is that you ran your, your system on the Stanford Bunny data set, and you will do this on your problem set, so you can join the ranks. Uh, okay, that bunny shows up everywhere. Uh, but this is ICP in actions. If you remember the, um, the dish loading robot uh, from Toyota Research Institute. Um, did you see what happened there? So there's a, there's a, there are two perceptions at work in, this, uh, in that video. Let me show it again. Okay, there's an initial one that's actually using mostly deep learning to try to find where the mug is in the sink roughly. But then when it gets close, you see this little realignment? That little, that was an ICP-based algorithm that was using the, the local camera on the hand comparing it to the expected mug and dialing it in and going in for the grab. And that's a pretty common pipeline, okay? That was it again right there, Oop, right there. A little refinement and then go. Can the camera see it that close? Yeah, right here you, it can see it. Once it gets too close, it, gets, it becomes blind. Right here. Right there it can still see it, yeah. You're right, it, they do have minimum, throw, minimum depth, and uh, it gets blind pretty quick. And let me give you one more sort of high-level motivation for the, the ICP class of algorithms. This is actually, um, this is when deep learning started, uh, you know, approaching some of these perception problems, and everybody was trying to train their first um, deep networks to try to estimate the pose of objects, which is an extremely powerful pipeline now. But the first versions of these algorithms all required you to label the ground truth pose in real data sets, okay? So this was a tool that was very useful for, and still is useful. We would take real data in the lab, that's the messy lab upstairs, okay? And we had a model of the drill, and we would just have a, a user interface, which after collecting a video stream of data, would just click, you'd click two or three times in the, in the interface, let me stop that, and uh, <clears throat> you click two or three times just to give ICP an initial guess. It would fit the point cloud into this really noisy point cloud, 
okay, this big complicated one, and then all of the images that you had from all the different interactions were suddenly perfectly labeled or labeled by ICP, and then you use that to train a, a higher level perception system. Yes. Yes. Do you have models of the cup? In that case, yes. Yeah. So in the, dish, in the dishwasher example, we had a model of the cup, the plates, the spoons. In fact, that's why we chose dish loading, was because you can sort of imagine you know, going into a restaurant and having a finite number of things. It's, like a, it's a pretty good case for the known model assumption, and we tried to take that as far as possible. And then anything we didn't have a model for that we couldn't register to one of the known models, we would throw in the, in the trash, yeah. <laughs> Every once in a while, we throw something important in the trash, but. Okay. So partial views, I think, uh, partial views, it makes sense to do scene to model correspondences for outliers. I'm sorry, uh, did I say that right? You'd like everything in the scene to correspond to at least one model, but for outliers, you'd like the opposite. And at some point, we have to do better than these hard correspondences of trying to correspond all the points to all the points, and we need some sort of mechanism to, to do something better than that, right? To, we're gonna talk about soft correspondences and we're gonna talk to, about outlier robust you know, correspondence rejection, basically. Okay. Is that the sun changing? The lighting's just, just changed a lot. Okay. Let's talk about soft correspondences first. Well, let me just, I, I had a couple animations here too. This is ICP in the partial, running in the partial view case. It can do pretty well, but it can really mess things up. Okay, and these, this is what happens with a few outliers chosen how I did, where I just picked some random points in the um, in the world. And those points, even as it tries to converge, are going to have potentially an overwhelming effect on the convergence of the algorithm. So that's what we're trying to fight. Okay. The first way we're going to try to fight it is by taking these hard correspondences and softening them. Okay. So um, let me write the same thing we're doing here. I used this notation right here. I used this, I'm gonna pick, I'm gonna sum over all scene points and, uh, and you look into the index of my correspondence. I'm gonna write the same equation, but I'm gonna write it a little differently and it's gonna lead to another um, algorithm here. So I'll take my min over x o in SE3. I want to keep my um, XO, PO, but now I'm going to do MJ minus PSI. And I'm going to hit this up front with a correspondence matrix, CIJ and I'm gonna sum over J and sum over I. Okay. This is now a correspondence matrix. And if um, CIJ is gonna be one if I corresponds to J, and zero otherwise. Okay, so this is just, I'm, I'm taking my original single sum with an index, I'm gonna write it as a double sum 
And basically, every time I, I sum through this, if I wanted to get exactly the same correspondences, I just set a lot of the terms in the sum to zero. Okay? But out, out of the box, I'm going to say there's a chance that all of the model, any of the model points can correspond to any of the scene points or any combination thereof. That's why it's a generalization, yeah? Now, if I wanted to impose something like, um, you know, every scene point must correspond to some model point, I could put a, um, or vice versa, I could put a constraint on the, on the rows or columns of this if I wanted to. But let's not. Let's leave it as a slightly more general case, right? This could have a row that's all zeros. It could have a row that, row that has multiple ones if there's multiple correspondences. Is that clear? So minimizing this is actually, since this is just a constant, if I use this as a constant matrix, if someone gives me this, this coefficient matrix, this is still something I can solve with SVD. Okay, it's got more terms, but it can still be solved in the same way. The trick is that this has to be fixed. Okay, you can't... What we, I would love to optimize C and X simultaneously to be able to leave this as a decision variable. But in this problem, this, the correspondences are given in a slightly more general way, and I'm still just finding X. And the interesting case then, the soft case, this is so far is the same as what I've written before. I can make these soft now. If I change and allow C, I, J is just between 0 and 1, for instance, instead of saying it must be 0 or 1. If I'm allowed to correspond a little bit with some of the points, right? I mean, does that make sense sort of in the equations? It turns out that's exactly what's happening in one of the famous softer correspondence approaches called CPD, coherent point drift. This is just another coherent point drift. CPD. It's one of the famous alternatives, if you will, to ICP, but you can really just think of it as a soft version of ICP. The CPD um, paper actually is all written in terms of the language of probabilities and trying to say I've got an estimator and, and, and the like, but it's exactly, the math is the same. You know, you're still, uh, you can, you, there's a probabilistic interpretation of what I'm writing, but it's just a Gaussian, and uh, the math is the same. So in the CPD um, paper, basically, they just say, on each iteration of the algorithm, I'm going to still I'm gonna initial guess x hat o, and then I'm going to set c i j to be basically like a soft version of the distance, like a, a, a Gaussian kernel around the points, right? I, if the, I'm going to take one of my points here and score the, the if I just have one dimension here, right? If this is my scene point here and my model point is here, then I'm just going to score in some Gaussian kernel the distance from the, from the uh, points. So there's a normalization term. And there's some parameters of that Gaussian, but roughly it's the distance we know. That's our estimated distance, right? Over some variance here. I'm just going to use this as my distance function, my correspondence function. 
Okay? And there's a beautiful, of course, the, you know, Bayesian sort of interpretation of that, but you can think of it just as a distance function that's giving you these correspondences. And then on step two, you solve SVD, and then you repeat. The word on the street is that this is much more robust than, um, it tends to be more expensive because you're summing over a lot more, you know, you're, you're summing over a quadratic number of points instead of a linear number of points. But, um, and so some people actually choose not to use the algorithm because of that quadratic cost. When point clouds get big, that can be expensive. But uh, it tends to be, uh, you know, just the word on the street is it's more robust. I think I have the snapshot of the Stanford bunny from the, oh, this is the CPD one, but this is roughly what you see in every paper. I could have put CPD on the bottom and it would have been a similar picture uh, where you see the Stanford bunny and you see it um, with some noise and stuff in it and then you see my algorithm is better than their algorithm, right? I think I thought I had the CPD one in here too. Yeah, here's CPD, right? And you see they corrupted it with, uh, Gaussian noise, it's all good, okay? But in practice, people do like CPD apart from its speed. Yes? In the distance robust, yes. was that IPC because of the quadratic uh, distance problem? That's a good question. So the ICP um, in the sync, why did we use ICP and not CPD in the, in the original one? There are, all, there are many variants of ICP also that, um, and sometimes more mature implementations. I think probably if that had been a pain point in our pipeline, we would have explored CPD. But I think the off-the-shelf ICP implementations were good enough for that job, and we worried more about, yeah, it was about the computational cost. Uh, in fact, <clears throat> because ICP is local, I can tell you specifically, because ICP is a local algorithm, it can run into minima, uh, we would actually take uh, like a handful of initial guesses for the pose of the mug given our original perception system and we would be in parallel run m multiple versions of ICP and take the one that fit the best go and we optimize that pipeline maybe before we fully thought about whether we should use a CPD or not. Yeah. We did explore actually a version of uh, a CPD like version too and I think that uh, was also viable. Yes. In this algorithm? Yep. So um, we still need the initial guess to come up with some initial correspondences. The notion of distance, which sets my correspondence, my initial correspondences. You know, before we were just using it to down select which thing to correspond with at all. Now we're setting the soft correspondence with it. I should use x hat in this. Yes. Thank you. I'd like one of those to be J. I wrote that whole term too quickly, clearly. Thank you. And this is also a function of I and J. I think that's right. Good catch. Yes? So we add RCP instead of CPD? To CPD? I think the, um, there, I would guess that there's somebody who's put RGB into CPD, but the, um, I, I don't see any reason why you wouldn't. I just wouldn't think that a Gaussian, you know, any Euclidean distance in RGB space is going to be only good very locally, right? People do it for ICP also. There's an RGB version of ICP where you put your distance across the RGB values in addition to the XYZ values. Um, I've always thought it was a little weird. <laughs> uh, there's, there's other, there's things you can do that, uh, that use descriptors, more general descriptors, uh, to do the point matching and stuff like this, and that makes more sense to me than RGB. But great. Okay, so this can be. Um, this tends to be. So how does this handle outliers, for instance, right? Compared to the ICP algorithm, what is this doing with with outliers? If I had the picture I drew initially, where I had a perfect point cloud here with two points way over here, what happens? Yeah. 
Exactly, right? So this one, unlike the, the original one, which is even at convergence is getting pulled by, the, um, by those outliers, depending on how you, which direction you put your correspondences, this one is effectively ignoring points that are a long distance away, right? So it, it handles outliers in a soft way. It also means that if you're too far away in your initial guess, you have no hope of converging. But, but this is intentionally keeping, having, introducing some notion of locality in our distance function, which is good. Yes? How do we get an initial guess? These days, you use deep learning to get an initial guess, and then maybe you use ICP, or you, there's even deep versions of the refinement that, that can work very well. But I think that's a very natural pipeline. You know, use a data-driven thing to take an initial shot and, uh, and then refine it with ICP. There are versions of this that we will cover, a I'll mention at least, at the end as we, in our last variance, that try to solve the global point correspondence problem, okay? And they don't work great. They, they're, they're, or they, let's see, there are some algorithms that will solve a global optimal problem, but it will take potentially to the age of the universe to solve. And there are other ones that, um, that are close to global, but, um, but in practice, people don't consider global point correspondence in noisy point clouds to be a solved problem. Okay, there's, there's sort of two important um, versions to think about. When you're thinking about how, this initial guess, how do you think about this initial guess? If you have a point cloud that looks like this, like it's a bunny, but it's a little furry, right? Then, then actually it's not too hard to get an initial guess. It's not too hard to, to solve ICP. If you're in this setting, for instance, right, where you, there is a drill in there for sure, but there's also like every other tool and a bunch of probably student lunch or something like this, you know, like there's all kinds of other stuff in the point cloud and you have to find the needle in the haystack. That's a much harder problem for initializing ICP and we don't have strong point registration algorithms that will solve that global problem. In fact, when, when we did this, this project to try to tr just label, we figured, who cares if it's slow? Let's take a global point correspondence algorithm to just generate the labels. It's offline, we'll just generate a big data set, no big deal. But we couldn't get a global um, point correspondence method to be robust enough to do the job. So it, it required having a human click. But those are two very different cases. It would be the Needle in the haystack versus a fuzzy bunny, okay? All right, so this is a soft version of rejecting outliers. Um, but let's try to work, let's think about how we could work a little bit more towards the, um, the rigorous sort of <clears throat> outlier rejection case. Right. The problem with this is that I still had to come up with that kernel function. I chose some parameters of a Gaussian, which was sort of arbitrary. Nothing about my data told me really what that, those coefficients should be. I picked some kernel, I tried it, I maybe tweaked the knobs until I, until I got something I was happy with. But really, if I could solve this jointly, saying that both C and X are decision variables, find me the best fit among any correspondences, that would be the dream. That would solve the global ICP problem. We can't do that, but we're gonna do something a little bit closer, okay? So let's talk about rejecting outliers. Basically removing spurious correspondences. And I think there really are two cases, okay? There's the easy case. I guess I called that the uh, fuzzy bunny. Let's just keep a stick with that. That's not what I called it here, but that's what I'll call it for today. The fuzzy bunny case, where we, we, we have almost our model in the, in, the, in the data, but it's just been corrupted by a handful of outliers. So, like, so really, I guess the, um, maybe to make that more formal, you could talk about the, the rate, the percentage of outliers in your data set, right? So if you have uh, you know, 1,000 points in my point cloud and 990 of them are 
bunny-like, and 10 of them are, are just spurious points, then that's sort of an easier setting. And then there's the, I've got a drill in a, you know, that, you know, 100 of my points are associated with the drill, but there's another 900 that's associated with other things that are interesting. That would be the hard case, right? case, there's a bunch of heuristics that I should acknowledge, but I don't want to dwell on. You can imagine heuristics, which are, you know, and you could sort of call this CPD approach heuristic, where you could just say, let's say, I'll truncate distances. You know, any, if I have my ICP loop and any distance that's greater than five, I'll just put a threshold on distance, for instance. I'll just remove those from the correspondence list, and that's fine, right? Other thresholds that sometimes people will put in, they'll say, I'm going to look for 100 best correspondences. I'll just put an upper limit on the number of correspondences to consider, right? And I can just put in sort of a, a threshold on that. And there's a bunch of algorithms like that, okay, which are useful. The hard case has more interesting algorithms, in my opinion. Um, and I'll list a few, okay? So one of them, actually, David, you said ransack last time, right? Ransack is random sample consensus. We're going to ask you to play with that one on the homework, and it's, it's, it's a pretty simple algorithm uh, to understand. In the few words, it is, I'm going to take my 1,000 points in my point cloud, and I'll try to pick 100 of them at random and start using ICP from those 100. And maybe the, I can combine it with a few of these thresholds on distance or whatever to bring in other point clouds that are fitting. But then I'll stop and I'll pick a different 100 initial point clouds. And I'll do that a bunch of times. And when I've happened to pick, if I, you know, if I do that enough times, then I'll hopefully, luckily, pick some subset of the point cloud where the, um, those initial subset gives me a good initial guess, and I can go from there. Okay? So it seeds, it's, it optimizes on random subsets, roughly. Let's say initialize with random subsets. Okay. Ransack is useful more generally in ML kind of problems and the like. It's, I hope the problem set will step you through that. And you'll get a basic understanding of that. <clears throat> I want to spend my time here talking about one that I think is much more clever. It leverages some of the, the geometry in the problem, which is um, using pairwise distances. Okay, what are pairwise distances and why is that a useful idea? So here's an observation. You remember how I said that, um, that the relative distances between points depends on the rotation? The relative positions between points depends on the position but not the translation. We use this trick, right? If I have a bunch of points on my point cloud, Right, then the relative positions, this vector here, if I take any two, any two points, right? If I do P of, let's say, MI, I'll just do M2 versus M1 in some frame. This is, um, depends on on the rotation. But not translation. That's what we used to 
justify, or that's how we de designed actually our SVD algorithm was we said we, we actually only have to worry about rotations because that vector, if I slide this thing around on the board, that relative position is invariant to translation. Okay, the pairwise distance This is the pairwise distance. Is invariant to rotations and translations. Okay, so if I put this object in some completely different configuration here, right? The distances between these points here is the same even though it's been under any rigid transform, right? If I just look at the length of the pairs, does that make sense? So if I were to go through my original model and compute all possible pairwise distances, okay? And now I go through my scene and I compute all possible pairwise distances. If my scene has a point whose pairwise distance isn't in the model up to some noise, then one of those two points had better be an outlier. Did I say that well enough? Right? If the scene, I'll write it like this, S1, S2 distance is not a pairwise distance in the model, then one or two is an outlier. Now that's a little bit weird, okay? Because, um, so I think that that analogy is perfect if I take an initial point cloud, if I have my model, and I think the real data is just a perfect translation of that, you know, and then some extra things thrown in. The mustard bottle, right? In practice, I made, a, I made some point cloud representation of my mustard bottle once, and I've got a different set of points that are all on the surface of the mustard bottle later. So, you have to put some margins on this. You can't say that um, you know, with exact equality these distances have to match. But in practice, like there's a, there's a distribution of, of expected pairwise distances that represent your object, which you can look for in the data without having solved any pose, pose estimation problem. If you can find a clump of points in your data, then, uh, then you can actually reject a lot of outliers. So there's a nice algorithm called Teaser, which is from um, an MIT group, Luca Carlone and uh, Hank was the lead author. <clears throat> Teaser actually had a bunch of different components of it, but one of the pieces that I'm highlighting here is this, uh, this outlier rejection step. Hank wrote a bunch of papers, and I'm sure that the piece, I think he had a different name for every piece of the algorithm, so there's a, there's a better name for just this piece, but it's all under the teaser umbrella. Yes? Yeah, good question. If I take the pairwise distances, yeah. still have the initial scenario, right? Because that's like the same distances and the model model on the same side. How do I tackle the data? Okay, so um, you're worried about reflections. Yeah. So, um, that's true. If you had a perfectly mirrored object, you wouldn't be able to distinguish it, I think, with the pairwise distance computation. I completely agree. I think that's, I mean, in practice, um, if I accidentally found the mirrored mustard, I guess I, maybe that's not the, the, the biggest problem. 
Um, but you're right. It, it's exacerbated, I think, in 2D on the board. It looks like you know you, the mirror operations is very natural. But if you think about you know um, objects of interest going through any rigid transformation, the case you're worried about, I think, would be a reflection where you're really going through some axis. And you're right. It, this would not distinguish that. But at very least, it could reject um, a lot of outliers. Right? Maybe not all. Good question. So um, this this teaser algorithm by uh, by Hank and Luca uh, made a really clever idea. Okay, they said we've got this cluster of there's some distribution of possible um, pairwise distances, and he said they said make a graph where the edges. I'm going to draw. I'm going to put the picture up that'll help. You make a graph connecting all the pa matching pairwise distances, and that actually if you can find the maximal clique in the graph. That is likely your your uh, your object of interest in the in the data. So let me show you there the picture that I used to think about this algorithm. Okay, so there's maximum clique in correspondence graphs. Okay, and this is actually the they they showed it in very complicated settings, big point clouds and the like. I, I was like, Hank, I just just explain this to me. I have a triangle. It has the sides three, four, and five. You know, uh, let's just work out that case first, okay? And I, and I liked his answer so much that it's not in the notes, okay? So, so hopefully this will help you guys too, okay? So this is the setting. I have my same model blue and salmon scene. And the setting I was worried about was what if I have the object of interest, my model, my blue, if it appears in the scene perfectly, and a bit like what your reflections question here, um, if it appears in the scene perfectly, but it also there's eno enough similar distances that appeared also in the scene. So I said, imagine you have a, you know, the exact triangle, the three, four, five triangle, but you also had a prism or a pyramid there that had three, four, 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 three. Right? You see what, I'm, what I was trying to do was make a lot of similar distances. The distance four shows in my data. The distance four shows more on the object on the right than on the left, even though the left is the right answer, correct answer. Similarly, the, the number three shows up a lot on the right. There, by counting, there's more correspondence, pairwise distance matches on the right. But the, right, the correct answer is on the left. Okay. The way their algorithm works is like this. Okay, so we're gonna, <clears throat> we're gonna make a, a node here if A on the, uh, in the model, point A here corresponds to A over there, if A corresponds to B over here, you know, each of these circles, each of these nodes in the graph is one possible correspondence from model to scene. Okay. An edge in the graph, in the graph happens if the distances, the pairwise distances match. Yes? So if, the, if A to A and B to B here is the same distance, then I'll put an edge in the graph. Otherwise, I won't put an edge in the graph. OK, so that gives you this graph structure of possible pairwise distance correspondences. And the claim in their paper was that the maximum clique is likely the object of interest. And indeed, this object here on the left has a bigger clique of three than any of the pairwise com comparisons on the right. So they defeated my counterexample and won me over. Yeah? But that's a very clever idea, isn't it? That, the, that this, you can use this invariance without even knowing the pose of your object at all, the rotation nor the translation. You can compute this quantity, and you can look for this, you know, the statistics of your object roughly in the data. I think it gets a lot harder when you have noise in the data and you expect those to be you know, almost pairwise distances. Then you'll have probably many more uh, edges in your graph and it's not as clear what the, you know, what the maximal clique looks like. But it's a, it's a very clever idea, okay? Questions about that? Yes? What is your Yes, that's a great question. So don't do, first of all, never do that with a robot. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, so your question, so um, 
I, I actually think this is a very, very good question. So Tom's asking, he says, um, what if my object is like long and flat and I'm looking at it like this, right? And I've got, first of all, you're gonna get no, especially on your iPad, you're gonna get no returns on the side. So that's just dead in the water probably. But, um, but even, I would say long flat objects on tables I think are a good example of how the ICP objective that we've been writing all day is actually probably not the right objective. Because um, if I had, I could, I could get a lot of good matches in terms of distance, even if this is shifted by a lot. If I'm looking at this object on the table, I'm probably weighting the edges a lot, right? Those are where all the information is. But the density of points I'm gonna get is is mostly on the top. So my ICP objective, I think, is deficient in that case. And you shouldn't think of this as definitely the right objective. That's a point I always try to make at the end, is that it's not clear that ICP is the right objective. And I think long, flat objects on tables, or books on tables is a great, or iPads on tables is a great example of that. Okay, people understand the pairwise distance? I mean, roughly understand? I think you should think through that example. I think I. It's in the notes, obviously, and uh, uh, it's worth thinking through. That one uh, was very impressive to me. I... <clears throat> okay, last version that I'll try to do today here for being robust is trying to solve jointly for the correspondences and the poses. Okay, so let's try to take the slightly more interesting version of the algorithm. And I'm gonna do that first with just a small modification of the original algorithm. I'll do the point to plane ICP. It's gonna be a window into, I think, into a bigger uh, idea here. So the <clears throat> idea here is I want my model is a triangle mesh, a triangular mesh, instead of a bunch of points. And I'm gonna do my example here just in 2D, okay? So let's just say I have my model looks like this, whatever, okay? Rather than represent the model only as a series of points. I'm going to model my, my in 2D, I'm going to model it as a, a line segment. You know, these line segments are the models, and I want to correspond points in the scene. Not necessarily just to the vertices, but to the closest point on the face. Right? In 3D, this is point to plane. Is that clear? I'd like to measure the, not the distance from point to point, but the distance from point to plane and allow it to match anywhere on the plane. Okay, so how would I write this? Um, how do I represent these meshes, these uh, triangular meshes? Okay, so typically you have a list of vertices plus a list of faces. Which are, these are points in x, y, z, and these are vertex indices, i, j, k. So, you know, this would have vertices, I don't know, one, negative one, it's gonna have another one, one, two, right? It's gonna have all these vertices listed and then it's gonna have a face saying that vertex one and vertex two are connected. In 3D it would have three numbers but in 2D it's got two numbers, right? It's got another one that says vertex two and vertex three are connected. This is my list of faces. This is one perfectly reasonable on disk, you know, you can, you'll, you'll find CAD formats that are basically just this, right? OBJs are basically just this. Okay, so I would like to now take a scene point and somehow correspond it to this face. 
So I want to correspond to the face and then have the math be the closest distance point to plane. There's a bunch of different ways to do that. You probably know the equation of the distance between a point and a plane. You can absolutely write that into your algorithm and, and work from there. I'm going to show you an optimization version of it, which I like a little better. OK, so let's try this. Let's, well, before I even write the full optimization, I'll make one point here. <clears throat> Instead of saying that my, um, my point is, you know, I could compute sort of the, the point to plane, the normal distance. I can write this equation for the point to plane distance. But let me instead say I'm going to correspond this point, this red point, with an equation that describes all possible points on that line segment. So let me say that carefully. If a point on a face is the sum over alpha i of the, of the vertices, and I've got a notation that I liked here, vi in face f, OK? Subject to um, all of my alpha i's being greater than 0 and the sum of my alpha i's equaling 1, then a perfectly good way to describe a, all points in this set in this vertex face representation would be as a linear combination of the points on the vertex that sums to 1. Okay, that's just the, that's a way to parameterize the, the set based on the boundary. Did I write that clearly enough? Yeah. Okay. So if alpha is 0, it might be all on this point, or, you know, if alpha 1 is, um, is 1 and the rest are zeros, it might be at this point. If alpha 2 is 1 and the rest are zeros, it might be at this point. And if I go between them, I'll get alpha 0 0.5, 0 0.5, somewhere in the middle. Okay, that's a standard sort of parameterization of, parameterization of any convex set, and it works for a convex, for a plane, for sure. Maybe the chalk. Okay, so now let's try to write minimize over x0 in SE3. Going to minimize over my scene points. This time I'm going to use the x transform the other way. So I'm going to modify my scene points into my, um, my model coordinates so that I can write um, sum over i alpha ij p. A vertex j in face i squared. Okay. There's one big point you have to get here. The details are, are less important to me. Okay. The big point here is that, so if you can contrast this to the, the CPD where I had a coefficient matrix off to the front, which was a hard optimization because I was multiplying C times my other decision variables. This is a, pr a clever trick where this, the, this, this term on the inside is linear in these decision variables, and it's also linear in these decision variables. So I'm optimizing over this, and I'm op optimizing over alpha. Okay? That's very nice. It looks very nice. I have to still say alpha ij for all ij, alpha ij greater than 0, and sum of alpha ij over, um, which one did I do it over? Over i, over the face, equals 1. That's something to work with, OK? Now these, remember that this optimization, if I didn't have these constraints, this optimization still has a solution via SPD. 
unfortunately, once you put these constraints in, it does not. So we have to open up an optimization playbook that I've only given a few tools towards, but not the, the full playbook. But this is another form of optimization, a more complicated form of optimization that you can use to try to solve this harder joint problem. Okay. It turns out, so the, there's, remember there's also these hard constraints hiding in here. The R, R transpose equals identity and the determinant of R equals positive one. It turns out that if you, that you, I don't know how to solve this, this big problem well, but if you're willing to relax this constraint to a softer version of this constraint, then we can, when we have nice solutions for this. And this is actually the crux of a lot of the uh, point cloud algorithms that are trying to use heavy optimization to solve this kind of problem. And the picture actually, I think, is very intuitive, okay? You remember this picture, which is my ICP objective? The quadratic bowl is a beautiful object for optimization, and it's still present here. This is still a quadratic objective. The, the red uh, circle is a horrible object for optimization. It just happened that we had a special case that we could solve with SVD. If I start adding other constraints on top of this that might look like lines through this or something like this, then I don't have a, so a solution with SVD. The things we know how to do with optimization are typically about convex sets. So the standard relaxation that people do for this sort of a, um, a constraint in the 2D case is precisely you're changing the circle to a disk. Okay, I know, I'm only intending to give you the fringe. I know I got a few uh, furrowed brows, but, um, but, but I want the geometry of this is that the, the relaxation of this hard optimization problem turns that circle constraint into a disk. And so when you hear people talking about semi-definite programming relaxations of point cloud algorithms, that's what's happening. It's happening in high dimensions, it's hard to think about, but it's just turning the circle into a disk. And I think if you're willing to say, so remember what happened before is, is I have a, I have some, uh, some rotation matrices that describe my data as well as possible. In the simple case, they ended up just landing, you know, in the noise-free case, they landed directly on the circle, okay? With noise, they might move away from the circle a little bit, the circle pulls them back. If you change the circle into a disk, then there's one type of noise you reject very well. If you're outside, if you're going outside the disk, then your relaxation is tight. If you're inside the disk, you're gonna possibly get things wrong. You're gonna come up with rotation matrices that are not true, proper rotation matrices. The orthonormal vectors are a little too short, roughly, okay? So I, I know I haven't equipped everybody with that, but I wanted to just make those connections that this picture I gave you before, which I hope you did understand when it first came up, actually is the lens by which you can look at much more complicated versions of the algorithm. Okay, where you can do things like attempt to find correspondences at the same time as poses. Okay, and they typically fall under the heading of semi-definite programming type relaxations. Okay, of point cloud of point registration algorithms, and the theory will say that they're tight in some settings, and that's typically the noise-free setting. They're tight, okay, and uh, when you get noise, they become loose. All right, so I think like 10% of you are happy with me for that. Uh, maybe, maybe in a couple of years you'll be like, oh man, it was worth him saying that. But okay, good, I said that. Um, all right, so I think we did a pretty good job with our agenda, yeah? So 
You guys know what ICP is? Have some intuition about why, when it works, when it doesn't? Some of the biggest sources of noise in our point clouds? Dropouts, partial views, outliers, and then a little bit of noise, but that's, I think, a small factor. I hope the soft correspondence has landed. That was, a, that was a, a pretty smooth transition, I guess. And then there was a bunch of different algorithms, right? The, the, the pairwise distance was a good one, and this SDP relaxation is, a, is another powerful one. Okay, I'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.